We'd like to welcome everyone that is uh, joining us today for our uh, Board Finance Committee meeting uh, for December. Uh, lots to do today and some interesting approaches to a couple of uh, uh, topics uh, that are kind of a new way to present, and so we look forward to that. Uh, but before we start, Rob, if you'll tell folks how they can participate, and then we'll also go around the table and introduce ourselves quickly without any biographical information, folks. Mm -hmm. Good morning. If you'd like to speak during the speaking of the public session, you can click the hand icon at any time. We will request then your name, your school, and association to the district. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Ms. Davis, would you get us started and introduce yourself in position? Sure, I'm Phyllis, the board's administrative assistant. Mike Morosky, board member. Eve Bolton, board member. Brandon Craig, board member. Irene Wright, superintendent of schools. Jennifer Wagner, treasurer. Kevin Ashley, Director of Financial Reporting and Transparency. Kimberly Hughes, Assistant Treasurer. Hi, Ed Roman, i Manager of State Federal Grants. Cody Hutchins, Contract Analyst. Okay, thank you. And thank you all for being here today. We're going to get a quick start on our first uh, topic is property, but I'd prefer not to start there because it's really reviewing a list, and I'd like to have a little bit more opportunity to make sure that we can get to our contracts and especially uh, with the new way of presenting them. So if uh, uh, the treasurer and the superintendent will uh, intro uh, that section for us and then uh, manage the uh, presentation, that would be great. You're talking about starting off with the property? No, no, no. I don't want to start with property because there's not discussion yet about that. I want to start with the contract. Oh, my apologies. That's okay. We've been very busy. So, um, Rob, if you want to pull up the PowerPoint. So traditionally, in the month of November, December-ish, Finance Committee has looked at, invited all the budget owners into Finance Committee <clears throat> to review each contract and determine intent on um, if it was up for renewal, what the intent was, um, or if it was going to terminate, why. And so over the past couple of years, we've um, started educating and training people to think in terms of the return on investment for their service, outsourced services. And um, <clears throat> we made a lot of progress. We'll have some way to go in terms of um, educating and, and formalizing. One of those things was to create and hire the position for Cody for contract analysts. He is taking, so what we did for um, all 884 contracts that were in active as of November 7th of this year, um, we, we created a key performance indicator document and had all the budget managers review them. So just to start off with some statistics, um, <clears throat> there's 883 that represent $198 million in services up for all funding sources. The range from the smallest to the largest was $54 up to $17.2 million is the highest. That $17.2 million is um, Hewlett Packard, and those were like um, lease payments. <clears throat> there are 120, out of the 883, there's 122 that are over $200,000. Those are the ones that you typically review in the fall. Um, in that 884 contracts, 500, there were 584 unique vendors. And so what we were seeing is a lot of multi-contracts per vendor. So I just gave you kind of the top three. Um, Hamilton County Educational Service Center has 39 different contracts with this district. Uh, that represent about $8 million. Since I built technology has 14, and those are technology for services, not telephone. And activities beyond the classroom has seven. <clears throat> Next slide. So focusing today on the contracts that are over $200,000, we... Um, Jenna, excuse yes. me, if you tell me a little bit, that's what we're doing today, what would then be the next day or or the next time we meet, just so we know? We're going to, uh, we'll, we'll finish updating you on the review status ones that are today, and we'll go it to over, in January, we'll go over the under 200s. Thank you. Okay. That was on a later slide, but thank you. I need, um, I need to know early. You know me. I need to know early and okay. often. I try to guess your mind, but I don't always get it right. Yes. Yes, yes that's right. Yeah, so, many people have played it. 
So the contracts that are over 199,990, which would be 200,000 and above, um, there's 122 of those, 88 unique vendors. Um, Hamilton County has five of their 39 that are over 200,000. And then <clears throat> um, activities above the, above the class, or beyond the classroom, not above, sorry, uh, three of their um, seven are 200,000 and above. So their dollar value of just those con those 122 contracts range from 200,000 up to 17 million. That's the Hewlett Packard one, and they average about two million. So <clears throat> um, next slide. So in the review process, every budget manager was asked to complete a form, um, and they were asked four questions: What key performance indicator are you using to measure success of this contract? What data shows your baseline? And what data reflects the progress made to date? And so they had to tell us. heard about the cookies. <laughs> I haven't gotten a phone call in two weeks. <laughs> Sorry. Well, it's better than in our principal meeting. Her phone just starts talking in the middle of it. And I wasn't even trying to hear it. Uh, now, I think it was you bizarre. need to talk to uh, Jeremy. Uh, <laughs> Somebody's always worried. listening. Yeah. yeah. So, um, okay, so next slide. So all 844 KPI documents came back to us for review. Um, and of those, we had 104 that were requesting to keep, three that we've eliminated or, or recommending to eliminate, and then 15 that are going through a second round of review. So the first review was by the budget manager and the ELT member, and the second review is superintendent and the treasurer. And so some of the documents that are under review are under review, next slide please, um, because either there was inf missing information, like they didn't understand when we asked for the progress to date that we actually wanted the scores or the data instead of the measure name. And so we have some re-educating to do. There's also, um, we're looking at anything that's high dollar, so anything that's over $2 million, because that's the average and not over 122. And then um, any contract that has multiple sites. We, were, we, all, we all knew, or at least I did, that we had a lot of con vendors who had individual contracts with different schools. What I didn't realize is that we also have the same um, trend in different departments. And so, for example, we have a lot of departments that do their own communications or their own graphics or their own contract with Sabercom. We love, we love Rob. But, um, so what we're what we want to do is consolidate and align because we're inadvertently by doing things business that way not complying with our own district policy that anything over a hundred thousand dollars has to be competitively priced and bid. Thank you very much. Okay. So there's an effort in that. Plus, um, it's an opportunity to invite others into the business so they're not just always repeating with the same vendors to make sure that we're um, always getting the best bang for our buck. And um, you know, trying to expand our, our supplier diversity uh, ba vendor base. <clears throat> um, we're also looking at contracts for the, that are staff augmentation, and we're looking, comparing whether it's better to continue to outsource or bring employees in house. Not always the most financially efficient thing to outsource. There's also the opportunity cost of controlling the staff um, and making sure you have really good evaluations. Um, we're also looking at contracts that are close to ex expiration, so they're just for the next round, like the resource coordinators are getting ready to expire, so that needs to be RFP'd. So some examples of things that are under review. Excuse are they, me, Jen. Yes. Uh, if I, the resource coordinators, or are you talking in terms of the lead agency? Or well, the lead agencies need to be, um, that process, that service of providing resource coordination has to be RFP'd if we're going to keep it as an outsource. Correct. But the resource coordinators started as employees initially as school community coordinators. And then we overlapped and we were double paying in some places without realizing it. And so now we need to go back and reevaluate, is it better to have the employee or to have that resource coordinator as an outsource vendor? Not eliminating lead partnerships. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm just talking about that particular resource coordinator service. It's just something to consider. I'm not making recommendation. We're not making recommendation for that. We just need to look at it. No, because we just did policy in terms of community learning centers and and resource coordinators. But yeah. but yeah, the 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 original intent was 
no, these were people from the outside, as from the lead agencies. And then when that became kind of, we were going to try to do it for all the schools, that became untenable. So, and you all did find other funding that to bring those resource coordination coordinators in house based upon some federal funding. It was a 21st century grant. Yeah. And so typical in an education, we get a grant, it goes away, and what happens to those people? That's right. They come to the general fund. And so so we were able to push them into the student wellness fund, but that has now gone away. And so now part of them are being paid out of ESSER, but that's also going away. So that's five, six million dollars worth of services that's going to hit the general fund in a big way. Right. So and I think Superintendent wanted to make a comment. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You got a question? Yeah, I was just going to follow up on that now. <clears throat> Classically, though, still with the clicky people, I believe those resource coordinators are funded from outside. Are they those those six aren't anymore. Or? I, I don't know who the clicky is. So right now we fund all 65 of the resource coordinators. Okay. So we and we fund them from in the district. The in terms of um, the conversation that we've had and doing a deeper dive into that role. There are two things that we're that we are that up for question that we want to do some deeper study around. Um, of course, we 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 still believe we need the position, we need the role itself. Someone has to shepherd all of the work that's happening between our partners and the school. But the question is whether or not this is the most appropriate time to recommend bringing those positions themselves back in house, because currently what we do is we pay sixty sixty five thousand dollars per position. The lead agency actually pays the person that is the resource coordinator, and then they're assigned to the school based on the lead agency. So it's it's not the 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 services that we're that are being provided from the lead agency right. is just the funding of the resource coordinator. We're not fun, fun, funneling our money through the lead agency for the pay. We are. We oh, are okay. paying the lead agency, so the RFP. We have a variety of lead agencies that have the resource coordinators. So we are paying the lead agency right. to then pay the resource coordinator. Yes, okay, good. I, that's, that's as I understand it, too. All right, and then when this last, our current budget, you all had, one of the things you were talking about was the community coordinator uh, a, which was an actual position, a district position, versus a resource coordinator. In some places, they had both. Right. So we, you were trying to deal with that. I remember right. that as being something. I think, uh, I think uh, Member Weinberg was talking, uh, was asking specific questions about that many months ago. So we actually, we actually cleaned that part of it, or at least had a plan for that part Good. for this year, um, where we did notice. Um, at the when I say I feel like it was last year, but it was the last know. school yeah. year um, where we we provided notice at that time mm -hmm. um, that based on our budget recommendations we were not anticipating continuing with those positions, okay. but we wanted to honor the people that were in those positions. So our recommendation was at that point, and what we've done since that time is any positions that were vacant we have not filled um, with the anticipation, and we notified the staff in July that this would be coming the end of this school year so that it gave them over a year to prepare for the expectation that we right. would not have that position and then they could also apply you know and be assigned to other positions in yeah. the district i think eliminating the kind of redundancy and getting very clarity about that would make good sense and i and i also think one of the questions that i have and i can wait till the end but yeah, just ahead. hearing some feedback from um, the finance committee in, in terms of as we are you know, looking to go deeper and make recommendations and get some recommendations from, or do some uh, conversations with the school staff as well. At the will of the the will of the finance. If if there's a question, I guess from the finance committee around the differences in terms of, you know, the resource coordinator position being a, a position that's in the district that we are paying for as a part of our staff augmentation, or if it's a position that is it, it continues to to you know, work the way that it works now. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Members just want to be able to discuss that more or follow it as, as we develop this budget. Or what are your thoughts, Mr. Craig? Uh, I think my my general thought would be that 
I guess it depends on how we're going to have that role be shaped by the individual independent organizations that are providing mm -hmm. the services, right? So like if that person's gonna be assigned based on their someone else outside of the district's assessments and determining who goes where, it does present that little bit of the question that we have with some of the other or some of the other agreements we have, which is who's actually in charge of the person? Yeah. yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah, I have a slide. I was going to talk a little bit about that. So okay. bear with me for just a second. So sure. are, the examples that I have on this slide are, you know, Hamilton County, because of the, the, val the volume and the dollar value, is under further review. DYC is under further review. There was missing information on there. They didn't have the results data. So we did, that's still under review. ABC is both multi-site and dollar value. Dream Builders, multi-sites. I think there's seven or eight different contracts with Dream Builders. And then Power School is under RFP. And we put that there because Power School is bought like every software vendor that we've done, we have business with. So they, they own our financial system, they own our SIS system, they own Performance Matters, Schoology, and one other one that I can't think of. What is it? True North. True North. So we bought all those and then Power School bought all them. And so we just need to, it's um, a, the whole conglomerate of stuff is um, under further review. So we just said it's still under review. Can I, can I just ask one quick question on the multi-site, which mm -hmm. I think is somewhat also part of the problem that the district's historically faced, which is that schools have kind of operated as their own little fiats and yes. done stuff. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but in, in some ways, bringing us back to a central process is there also that review as to going forward what those processes look like? Because what would yeah. be problematic is if we clean it all up now and then we just read, three years from now they have the same right. problem again. Well, which is why we added um, Cody's position because he's going to help the purchasing department determine when things start hitting those triggers. You know, like um, so he's right now he's collecting all the key performance data and making a database out of it. But he's going to help look at with things that are coming up for renewal. When, when they start. So another little nuance is I've noticed, I think it started accidentally when we did the 90 day appropriation is that people start with a small contract, $40,000. Then they amend it 12 times and it becomes way bigger, but it never got RFP, right? So like uh, Dream Builders, for example, they're, they're in total, it's over almost $500,000. That service should have been RFP'd. But because it's little bits in seven different places, it never made that the, that business logic that we have built in. Well, so we're looking to update all that. The cynical among us would also say that that may not be happenstance. <laughs> so, and the other thing that if I could add one more thing as well. Um, so the other piece that we are also working on, and I think it's going to come up as well, is the entire um, procurement process in terms of the, you know, the oversight for RFP. So this is really done in a partnership to answer your question mm -hmm. um, in terms of, you know, when we initially talked about the recommendation for adding the additional position, it was to make sure that we had more oversight of that process in terms of the contracts, but we're also um, moving back so that we start with the team that's responsible for the RFPs. Um, and for actually doing the writing of the contracts because it really should be something that's reviewed at that level before it ever makes it to, uh, you know, the, the, the treasurer's team. And mm -hmm. really it, when you're, when you have a system. Um, and so we're, we're working with um, the, the procurement processes is, is with the chief operating officer. And so we're working with, with in, in partnership in that space as well to add really more um, structure honestly, um, to what that looks like. It, it's not comfortable, but it's necessary. Um, and it's necessary in many other things that we'll see coming up in just a few moments as well. In, in the in, intent or not, state auditor doesn't care. He just knows that we violated something, right? And so we're, what we're trying to do is protect the district. There's another um, concern I have about our foundation and that there's some money, donated monies that are being deposited with the foundation to kind of Simplify the procurement process, um, which it would be a violation. The money should be deposited in the district's bank account if it's intended for the district. And so that's something that I'm working with the foundation leader on um, identifying and um, fixing. Which foundations are you talking about? I'm talking about ABC. 
I just didn't want to call. It. I, I don't know. I don't think anybody's intentionally doing anything wrong. I just think no. it's um, kind of just trying to simplify things. But what they don't understand is it doesn't matter <laughs> from a state auditor. It's an inconvenient thing, right? Especially per school. And you know, we recognize that we our the complexity of our process is sometimes frustrating. And so we put a quality improvement process team together, and we went from an average district wide. Now remember, we have 14,000 purchase orders that are issued every year. Average district wide, when we started, was around 10 days. We're down to less than five now, from requisition date to purchase order date. That's a huge improvement. Um, and so we should, we're trying to make it simpler and faster, and um, reject less and teach educate people and so we've we've made a lot of progress but um, you know people always want to go for convenience well it's part of that they're kind of serving as a I won't say financial agent but that the those sorts of procedures are in place to make it easier is what you're saying mm -hmm. and, and really are not correct our procedures are put in place to um, follow the state and federal laws Right. And sometimes they're they're met, sometimes they're just complex and frustrating, and you know they just are. But I don't we don't have the um, choice to not follow them. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> we're we're trying to make it as our activities to be as short and quick as possible to help better serve our school and, and department users. And you're in a better place to do that now than you were several years ago. Yes, we've made great progress. Yes, which was uh, an issue. Right. Okay, so flip it to the next slide. Um, so here's a list of the outsource versus insource things that we're going to go through. I, Jeremy's already looking at staff, his staff augmentation contracts to determine, because sometimes technology expertise is very expensive to outsource, and you have less control over that activity. So we're looking at those. We're looking at the curriculum instruction, you know, the, uh, the $8 million of coaches and managers that we contract with Hamilton County. Department of Student Services has a lot of outsourcing. Go back to the technology staff augmentation. Mm -hmm. It's outsourcing care and feeding of the technology, so to speak. Right. Yeah. right. And a so lot of it is, but that. there's also some positions that are in central office function that are outsourced because of this desire not to bloat central office, but it doesn't necessarily make financial sense. We're just reevaluating. Well, part of the not bloating was also a political consideration in levy time. Correct. Just say it. Well, it now, came out of the Banger Commission report back yes. in the early 90s, yes. And 90s are far behind us. Yes. So we just, we're just looking to, for financial efficiencies and better operational efficiencies, determining whether it doesn't make sense to continue to outsource or to bring that work in-house. Yeah, it's time and to. So, yeah. And so um, board member Craig alluded to the whole how much control do we have over those employees? So what, that from the IRS perspective and from the retirement system perspective, some of our outsourced contractors are considered employees. And so, you know, like our bus drivers. Our bus drivers are, uh, because we outsource all our services, um, they're still considered employees in the eyes of the state because it's a traditional employee role in the state. Now, they pay into the retirement system on our behalf, the, the bus vendors do. but. Um, there, that, those are, there's a checklist of items that they consider, and um, we've had some issues in the past, so we just need to make sure that we don't redo them. Anyway, um, instructional equity, the resource coordinators we talked about, athletic directors, and um, the Hamilton County um, staff augmentation kind of is repetitive there, but I, I wanted to make sure that we were being as transparent as possible. Could you go back to curriculum and instruction? You mentioned uh, coaches and what else? I mean, uh, instructional coaches, not athletic coaches. It's Either essentially a, a combination of staff. So through curriculum and instruction and, and I, okay, I wanted to make sure that we, they weren't separate. It's primarily um, that. It's instructional coaches. It's individuals that act as um, um, staff support, but they're coming from Hamilton County. And for DSS, which is there as well, um, it also comprises many of the individuals that serve um, as um, administrators, uh, where they work through Hamilton County and work less. They don't work during the summer as they work through Hamilton County. Um, and I think one of the things to consider as we're thinking about outsourcing is a lot of the work that happens to prepare for the school year happens during the summer, um, but these individuals that are also administrative in nature um, don't work during that time. 
in, in the state of Ohio, there's some uh, requirement or expectation that these uh, educational service centers are used uh, in part because they do some of the evaluation of the school districts, if I recall. That was always Mrs. Uh, Ronan's a position. Well, least. there's in the state foundation formula, they actually deduct. Is, is it still $6.50 per student? It's a couple hundred thousand dollars. To subsidize ESDs. Yes. And so there's a service that they should provide us for that money. But we're spending $8 million at Hamilton I'm County ESC. I'm surprised it's not more. I would have anticipated that it's more, but okay. Just a quick question Mr. with Craig? the thinking about outsourcing versus insourcing of different roles and positions. Will there be some type of standard as to kind of, again, I think about this going forward, uh, that expectation of if a position is, if we're looking at whether or not to outsource a position or, ins or bring it back in-house, what expectations we're looking at, what are the different factors we're looking at, because mm -hmm. to your point, the law does require some evaluation of that regardless of what you call them right. or how you employ right. them. Um, but I think it'd be helpful to folks as they're thinking about different things that we're going to open up, or if they're different programming, software rating, or if yes. they're different opportunities in the schools. I think I think the other thing is, um, and I, I, I do believe it's going to come up as well, or maybe this is the slide where it is. It's really getting clear from the board in terms of the will of the board around the thought of having the staff that's in house versus not. Um, just knowing that. At, at some point, <clears throat> there was the goal not to have the staff, you know, actually um, be employed by the district, but we're still paying for them. And in many instances, we're paying more than we would be paying if they were staff members that were in-house. And so when we think about um, things like the support that we're providing to schools, um, the evaluations that we're doing for teachers, um, because some of these individuals do that as well. Evaluations for students in terms of um, students with special needs under DSS, those individuals uh, being employees of the district would definitely have um, a greater benefit, you know, in terms of just oversight, in terms of follow-up, in terms of um, just the accountability cost um, that we've talked about earlier. It, or that. So I think when we think about it, if we were looking globally, we would begin to think about the type of service that's provided and whether or not it is best that that service comes from someone that is an employee um, versus just the service that, you know, for someone that's outside. Um, so I'm envisioning kind of a checklist every time there's a potential opportunity moving. Once we do this and we will come up with a checklist, just similar to the one that we did when determining whether a position belonged in SERS or STRS, right? Because there was a, um, kind of several years ago, we had two or three positions that the auditors found that were in the wrong, paying into the wrong union, I mean the wrong retirement system. And so we created a checklist to determine that. So I'm envisioning that so that when a new contract or a new employee is presented, there's a group that reviews the checklist to make sure we're all on the same page. Mr. Morosky? I was just going to say, I mean, regarding what the superintendent was talking about, and I've said this um, for years beyond the board, I'm glad we're talking about this. I, I, I would just as soon have our employees working with our kids be our employees, particularly if <clears throat> we're not particularly, I already, I knew we were paying them, but if we're paying people more and we could even save costs and have more oversight, it doesn't make any sense to me. Now with the back a few slides, in the conversation with the uh, the resource coordinators, I understand the wisdom of having those people be in the community from when that mm. happened. I wasn't here then, of course, but I've, I've learned enough about it and policy we've talked about enough that I think I get the progression. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's still relevant. Um, I could be wrong. I, I don't know. I mean, in some schools, we talked about this in policy, so I won't rehash it, but I mean, that in some schools, it works really, really well, <clears throat> but it is it is a case-by-case basis and in some schools the resource coordinator understands the value of working with the principal in concert you know and in other schools not uh, sorry go ahead. Go ahead. I would say from a treasurer's mm -hmm. perspective it's very challenging mm -hmm. because they tend to operate and make a lot of financial mistakes um, and given a little bit too much financial autonomy out in the schools yeah. Uh, I think I think uh, I think with the policy efforts that we've made, I think is there's an opportunity to review the and, and the most important review that has to take place is the inequitable 
in equity of our resource coordinators and our lead agencies from a standpoint of some of our schools have fantastic arrangements and some of them don't. And so I think that that's, that's the bigger review for me. But I, I also think that um, I, uh, I, I wonder, and I have, I can remember when every organization, public organization, especially schools, were outsourcing as many things as they could. And they were doing it to save money, which now that might no longer be the case. They were doing it in honesty. They were doing it to limit the number of collective bargaining members. I can specifically remember that. Well, let's not have more union people join us. We got enough problems. So we're going to be in house. That's what's going to happen. There were, there were reasonable reasons to do it and there were unreasonable and cynical and whatever. Uh, so I'm very much in favor of outsourcing as little as possible. Um, and, and I think the reasons for doing it then uh, in that period, and everyone was doing it, uh, I think are, are <laughs> the reasons might still be there, but it isn't a savings of money and we have become way too dependent upon other people being successful employers, uh, whether it's for transportation or whether it's for professional development. And also there's a whole bunch, and this is the cynical part about partnerships, the, there's a whole bunch of, of organizations that depend upon our public funds to have their reason for existing. And then they hire the people they know. So the, it's all become rather... Um, it is. It, that it, it is too, it, it, there's too much interplay. And so I think that this is a big discussion, but here's the problem. I don't want this big discussion to delay us in having an impact on this year's budget. I don't think it will. No, we won't. We're, okay. we're, we're doing well. We, we've done yeah. a lot on the under yeah. already. I, okay, so no, that's cool. I, I'm still worried that you found there's a hundred and something of these things we want to keep. That seems like a high number still to me. And I would like to see that list that you think would be kept. So you have it in the, this document okay. in full transparency. In the big one. All of our notes for the over 200. Okay, okay right. good. So you, and it says keep eliminator review. Gotcha. For the big one rather than the PowerPoint that we're. Yeah, that's yeah this, this, this is, is no way I can put this on the screen. No, no, no. And I don't want you necessarily to. <laughs> so, I, I also so, don't want there's there's a the public document and then there's the not. All of this is public. Yeah, mm -hmm. everything I do is public information. At, at, for all of us. So, um, so just to kind of, before I go to the next slide, don't go to the next slide yet. Um, well, let's just talk about this document for a minute because it's, um, it shows you the contract number and the, because it's a C23 number, it means it's this year's number, right? So it's a, um, the department that it's from. So department eight is athletics department. Um, I'm just looking at the first line, the EOT member who was over that, which is Dr. Davis, but it's not Dr. Davis anymore. It's the new guy that starts next month. Um, the vendor, the budget manager, the type of service it is to the best of our ability, um, the board approval date, start and end date, the value, and I'm giving you the final value because I had the original value and then all the amendments, but it just, you just need okay. to know what the total value okay. is. I will tell you, though, that we had a contract that was amended nine times last year. Nine. That's insane. Okay. So then whatever's in the body of the re requisition of the purchase order is the comments. So it's telling you what the service is supposed to be. And, and whatever typographical errors or grammar, it's whoever typed it in. Um, the term, whether it's annual or a multi. Um, and then the multi-year tells you it's the first of a three-year contract there, or if they're, okay, that's what that means. Null means nobody entered any information. The fund that it came from, so 507 is ESSER, fund one is general funds, 572 is title. You guys have a list of that. It comes out in the treasurer's report every day, every time. And the estimate that was for sometimes people said it's going to be the same value. Some people said, well, I think it's going to grow or it might even be less value. And then I did a savings value. So if it was under review, I didn't put a value in for next year until we finish reviewing it. So it's not really a 400, like this one that's fourth down, ABC. It's not really a four hundred sixty-five thousand dollars savings. It's just it's uh, we're not done with it yet, okay? And then any comments that we were able to add, 
Um, for example, Power School, about halfway down the page, a little bit more than halfway down the page, the Schoology subscription, is, it's within the current RFP, so we don't know anything yet. The, the statistics are kind of on the back page. So I'm telling you how many contracts are for each vendor that are in this group, and then how many of the contracts are in each scenario. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't do the vendor numbers on here. I did the value of each fund and the status of the, what they were. So, next slide. Can I real quick question? Yes. In the multi, is the R recurring renew or renewal, or is the ones that have an R, so like R1 colon 3? Yeah, it was a renewal on one of cycle. three. Yeah. Yeah. Just a uh, quick. quick statement, Janet. It doesn't need to be go back, but I think. The same you made earlier about wanting to have that process set up, that a checklist. Yeah. I think that also will address a lot of what was being talked about over here because mm -hmm. I think in some ways that allows us to reevaluate what our expectations are for contracts coming in mm -hmm. to be able to assess whether or not this needs to be an employee or not an employee. Um, if we have a checklist, if we have some way of looking and saying, this work is something we just we're not going to be the expert that we're on, and we don't have enough of it to make it worthwhile to be an employee, but we need the service done versus this is something we're going to do all the time. So I, I exactly. love that idea of having a checklist. Yep. And, and that's exactly, uh, if I may, that's, ex that's exactly what we have talked about. Um, so we, when we think about it in now, you know, coming to the updated space of where we are with, with outsourcing or insourcing, um, knowing that at the, at the snapshot in time or the period of time that that's the that's the that's where we were that's the position that we were in we've moved forward from that point and so with that i think that you know we look at some of those positions that we say this doesn't need to be an outsourced position um the other thing is having done uh having you know led a project very similar to this in in, in my last role you generally get something different from employees when they are members of the organization um, because you're then there isn't a go between um, that you are responsible for them and so as we've talked about you know if you think about outsourcing it should be one of two things something that's very specialized that we you know having that individual as an employer those set of individuals that, as an employee at this point would not be um the best for us to do because of the the level of specificity that's needed or if it's a short amount of time that you need the need the work for that it doesn't it really just doesn't make good fiscal sense to bring them in for you know an extended period if you're looking to do something this is going to be a six months or this is going to be a one year something that we're doing to get systems done and set up, not something that we're looking to continue. So we definitely have, have worked through a lot of that as well, talked through a lot of it. I like the checklist. I like the, the placing certain values as to when you would want to outsource or when you wouldn't want to think because things have changed. Of course, I one of my classic examples is outsourcing crossing guards is a disaster. It's a disaster. Mm -hmm. It is a disaster because we would have more of them, and we could make that part of our school community, even part of our neighborhood, part of our outreach to the community. We could mold various positions together that could make some people that are part-time positions actually into full-time positions. Plus, it's a way to involve our parents, our families, and employ them and have them be a part of whatever it is. I will never forget the, it was quick, quick, uh, God God rest his soul, Chris Nelms' mom was a crossing guard at Fairview in Clifton. And it, it meant the world to all of us <laughs> to know that that's within the family or that there's a, so there are things that we could improve the quality and the actual identity and culture of our buildings if indeed we did less outsourcing, which was a fiscal decision or financial decision. So I think that would that would go with your idea of being pre to be present. It's a part of the culture piece. Uh, so I think uh, I think I'm real excited about the uh, rethinking the whole outsourcing, and I like the the idea of having this kind of checklist and having a dialogue. And it's it's good right now from a contract standpoint as as the most senior member on this particular committee, um, 
I'm very, very, yeah, I'm very, very glad that in this uh, effort, the, the uh, treasurer has a full-time partner uh, in the superintendent. Me too. Because that is something <laughs> that the financial side of the house has always been up against, doing the best possible thing that we could do for all of this, because this is stuff people don't want to touch, and we have to be ready to touch stuff, because this is all, I'm certain, this, just like ad hoc, it's mm -hmm. just stirring the pot. <laughs> uh, but that's, that's so there's needs another, to be done. I'm sorry. There's another unintended consequence that we deal with um, through outsourcing. And then one of the perfect example is the city nurses. Oh. Because when you look at all the ODE reports, it shows that we have no medical nurses, right, when we compare to all the other districts. So I the ratios that. I are heard wrong. that in Columbus two years right. ago. So, um, and, you know, um, so there's other examples of that, but that's the one that comes to mind just because it's big dollars. We're up to almost $8 million in nursing now. The, the, the best example of a partnership that is, that I can truly justify is all of the work that's done by Interact Health slash Growing Well and our school-based health centers. These people are providing things that we cannot do. Oh, yeah. And they and other folks are yeah. paying for it. Yeah. I mean, to me, and that's sort of the old classic Community Learning Center lead agency, although they're not lead agencies. But that's uh, that's a microcosm to study as to how that works as we maybe re kind of reshape what it is that we're trying to do. Uh, and we couldn't do any of that. Several months ago, I think, I, th I can't remember if it was at a policy committee or a finance committee, we talked about having that inventory. Yes, of policy. policy. Wasn't, yeah. okay. Inventory. Of all those partnership services that are out there. The at, we, call, we called it an assets, but... Um, I don't remember who was yeah, okay. taking the lead on that. So we, I, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say just to highlight that that came up in the goals guardrail sessions that we hosted, and I'm sure it mm -hmm. came. I know it didn't want to brand. I'm sure you've heard it too. That said the first question of what is CPS doing well? They should keep doing. Virtually every one of those conversations started with, "I'd love to know everything that you are doing," and not in a not in a snotty way either. Right. And it was God, usually in a positive way. Like we know you all do a lot, but. I don't know that we know everything. I don't know that I know everything. I think I know a good amount, but. So one of the um, areas that we have spent time auditing from the beginning, I, I, I'm going back to the beginning of the year, but from my time here until now is the services that are being provided um, as additional support services through whether it's a community learning center or whether it's through um, more, really more specifically the partnerships that we have. So. What is it covering? You know, is it mentoring? Is it after school tutoring? Is it um, um, bully prevention? Whatever it is. So that will be one of in January. That will be one of the next audit type sets cool. of information that you will receive. And it's actually broken down as well by school um, so that we're seeing it by school across schools as well so that we can really have some conversation. One conversation, but two, where are their gaps? Yep. Right. About equity, even the, yeah, yeah. And as we're even thinking about, to your point, um, in doing that, what we've been able to see, of course, already is you have some areas that you you have is so much support, you know, it's trying to figure out, like, who doesn't need the support in order to support. And then in others, you're pulling teeth trying to get someone to go in and support. So I think that that's going to be elevated. But that would be one of those conversations um, that I think that that the entire board is going to want to spend, you know, some time just discussing. Real quick. And these two, this is awesome. And these two issues are part and parcel of one another, too, right? A hundred percent. So whether or not we're making a decision in source, outsource, where does it go? I mean, this is this is really good. And, and defining the difference between a vendor and a partner. Yes. Well, even I got in trouble with a, a former, former, former transportation, <laughs> in trouble, former, <laughs> former, former transportation director, uh, which said, uh -huh. with all due respect, uh, so-and-so is a vendor, not a partner. Um, yep. and, and not to be jerks, but there are times when it's like, well, we got to make sure, you know, it's like, well, we're paying these so, a lot. We're paying the money. Vendors. Right. If we pay them, I don't want to sound like a tough guy, but if we pay them, to that point, yeah. if we pay them any money at all, yeah. they're a vendor. That's right. And so and and we partner sounds better, you know, and we use it interchangeably sometimes, but we try to clarify yeah. that these are they're vendors, yeah. they're contractors because we are paying them. Um and I think the more we do that, it's just more transparent yeah. as well. 
Yeah. Last thing for me on outsourcing too, I, I'm believing to bring so much back inside unless some other entity is able to offer something we can't do ourselves. Right. I mean, that's the, that's the, the school-based health center model. The other piece is obviously we are not currently organized, even with the changes that you've started to put into place, we're not currently organized in a way to not be doing all this outsourcing. So, I mean, it would seem to me that you have to probably, or maybe we are, I don't know, but since we've been doing this outsourcing for over, what, 12 years or nine years, maybe maybe there's a way to show us that we are, we are currently organized, that we could absorb these uh, these employees or whatever. That might help us understand how we how we could do it. Not whether or not we should do it. I don't know it's, that it's an organizational thing, but it's a budget allocation thing. Definitely so that. The conversation we had yesterday was she asked me, why is so-and-so doing their own graphics when we have a communications and marketing department that has an expertise? Or One right? of the reasons it's still too small. Well, well, that's the problem. <laughs> the, that's the problem. Well, yes. where we're doing yeah, it. Yeah, right, exactly. Right. So right. they, so what happens is the the community, the public, old public affairs department would develop a budget, and somebody would come up with this great idea. They didn't have the budget for it, so the department was responsible right. for paying for it. But then we just continued it that way year after year after year. So those are things we were talking about yesterday. Maybe that's a better way to say that's what, what we're talking trying about. to say. Yes, it's just processes and whatever, right. and practices are going to have to be reorganized. I think the other thing is we're, and we may have called it um, in the com in the conversation, we may have called it staffing alignment or realignment, but a part of the review elevates, and I'll use the same example that our treasurer used, a part of that review also elevated, you know, if we have 10 different places that are doing their own contracts around X, we need to collapse those things together because that, that means that there is a need, but then that, so we wouldn't necessarily still need that funding, but that then becomes additional positions that we need to add to support the needs of the organization, not to continue yeah. to do, you know, some of the things that would, so that's a part of yeah. the overall process as well. Right. When I look at, if we'll go back on the slide, um, when we talk about the outsource, insource slide, Rob, the other way, I'm sorry. <laughs> right there, right there. When we look at just this slide, um, there, when we think about the way that we're current, currently organized, mm -hmm. there would not be anything here that our current structure would not allow us to oversee. Right. When we think about what's here, mm -hmm. um, because in many of, so if we use, for example, curriculum and instruction, there are additional individuals, so the structure is already there. It's just that the people are being paid, are being paid as contractors versus employees. So they're still a part of the district's structure. They're just not being, they're not employees of the district. So we can actually go through each one of those and, and you see the exact same thing in terms of the work that's happening from the outsourced organization. There isn't anything extra that they're doing there that the district could not, is not either already doing in terms of some level of duplication or the district could not do based on the ones that we're, when we're talking about just the outsources versus insourcing. <laughs> okay, so back to the next slide, <laughs> the last slide, that one. So next steps. Um, so the what I wanna do, and I didn't get an opportunity to do it yet, um, is take this information and start applying the things that we've been learning in our Edgenomics class in, in always presenting a per pupil cost as we're evaluating and approving contracts, because it when it when you drive it down to the per pupil cost, sometimes it, it might drive you to a different decision about whether we want to invest in it or not. So that's the first thing. But so the we're using the school program audits that the superintendent staff did in determining um, each school's program audit and are they properly uh, are the contracts that go with them are, are they aligned are they effective and do they need to grow or go away? So we're looking at it from that perspective. We're continuing to do the under 200,000s, collecting more information. We eliminated a lot of the little ones, and so you'll see a lot of that in the next presentation in January. Um, and then also, as we're starting to talk about central office budgeting, we're gonna start addressing those multiple site things, um, and then the in-source outsourcing. And then um, also, at, 
as we go through the school-based audits, aligning that to the whatever programmatic decisions that are being made, looking in terms of equity um, on all those contracts. And so we're trying to look at it from different perspectives, not just one. Um, and but we'll, it, this might take a couple of finance committees meetings to get through because it's going to be in com, in conjunction with the strategic plan and the budget cycle. And so we'll continue at each. Well, maybe we'll just keep it as a standing agenda item, and we'll just update you as we go. And if I could also add a part of this process as we're going through, um, you know, completing the reviews and then going through the audits is also and and the recommendations that we're looking to make. Um, while I believe from everything that I've seen, the, the treasurer and I are, are on the same page. We, we're on the same page about what recommend or what things we would like to recommend moving forward, but we are um, looking to engage um, different staff members in that as well. So that we're having conversations, you know, whether it may be small groups with principals around how this impacts what you're doing in your role. You know, with those that are, are are doing some of the background work, what is the impact to you, or you, do you see a difference in impact? So it becomes a part of the recommendations that it's that it's a little more inclusive in terms of you know this is kind of how we got to this this point as well. So it'll just give us more information. Do you like this format better than having everybody come in and do the right thing? We said we told you that the one you <laughs> proposed. Awesome. Fish for compliments. Yeah, we told you. <laughs> One of the things I shared with the treasurer, you know, in just trying to look at the historical says, perspective is it, it's important. While it's great to have individuals come in and talk about it, what it does at our level is it gives us the comprehensive landscape. So when I heard that that's what we generally do, I, I, sh I share, you know, with the treasurer, my recommendation would be that we let let us do that work together first, because you know you may have someone that comes in and says I, says I want to keep this, which is we've had with some of them, and then when it gets to the review with me and with us, we're saying what what is the purpose? Why is this necessary? So it really takes it uh, to a deeper level. So we're we're pleased that that was that was beneficial. And we're pleased that people did that. We're pleased that we felt we needed to share with the public that people that own the budget have to come and and. Uh, Claim it and try to explain it. The last two months or the last two years that we've done it, it hasn't been as successful as the previous ones. And I and I think this is a much better way uh, um, in an agro kind mm -hmm. of uh, aggregate and disaggregate way of looking at it. And I appreciate this. I think this works. And this will more impact <laughs> the discussion on the board. And it will also, uh, I think, uh, help make more cuts and more changes. So the vision for me is as um, once we get all the KPI information, and we're, we, we're changing the culture to start focusing on return on investment, right? Because we have shrinking resources. We've got to make, make our dollars drive out student outcomes. So as we're building the database of key performance measures, my vision is that we will not go into the treasurer's report and make a recommendation to renew or add a new contract without those measures being communicated. Either this is the success it had, we want to continue it, or here's a new vendor and this is how we're going to measure this for this purpose. And so that's kind of the vision that we're building into. I just said, well, two thoughts. So uh, first, I think the measuring per pupil is great in some ways. I also think that we need to make sure we're also categorizing, as we talked about before, with there's certain programs we have to do. Right. So like even if they only benefit, it may be helpful to know what that dollar per child is so we know whether or not the vendor itself is the appropriate vendor to be providing the service more so than the service is the appropriate thing to be done. So I think that's the like one caveat there. Uh, I think the other part is that it's really helpful to, to have the high level instead of the minutia at times yeah. because the minutia doesn't always make sense when you look at it just by itself, right? right? And I think sometimes that, that from my board perspective, mm -hmm. our our role is to be able to evaluate the and give direction on the high level right. direction we're going, not on the I don't really like that particular company oh. who provides <laughs> that particular oh, service. Yeah. We have to like them. <laughs> right. I want to know. 
I'll take it one step further. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that does provide, I think this kind of modeling, this yeah. path forward, yeah. provides us with the information to know whether or not yeah. the vendor is being successful for our students and whether our students are being successful as a result of the vendor's work. Mm -hmm. I, I think the other thing that we've also talked about, and you, you, you know, you, I don't know if that you saw this, but this is conversation that we had prior to recommending to you a, a balanced budget is to your point, the dollar amount, it may be a higher dollar amount, but when we look at the population, the return on investment, what we're looking to do with that program, it doesn't mean that it goes away just because it's a higher dollar amount. It just becomes one of those data points, one of the indicators that we know about, and we're cognizant of that moving in. So we actually, we work, we've worked through that quite a bit. And it's an, also an opportunity to keep, continue to educate the public on some of those challenges, because sometimes it is a compliance measure. It's very costly. So, you know, the United States average on per pupil spending is $14,000 per child. And so the way we can help explain why that is, is some of it's just not even under our control. But yeah. I think, too, to going back, uh, much of, of the, the individual contract piece or the then and the nows, some of this was an attempt, and I think it was successful, in part by the treasurer, uh, there's sometimes in order to change culture, uh, it's important to be held publicly accountable or that you are going to be appearing before the finance committee to talk about your budget or what have you, or you're going to share with the public or what have you. So I think I think we're in a, in a very good place right now. And I like, I like the way that we're approaching this at this point in time. I mean, she was laughing at me yesterday because I was so excited about the data geekiness of me. <laughs> so, Such a geek. I, I am a geek. Her. We speak the same language. So, yeah. you know. Well, this so, is scary. She's hashtag be president. I'm hashtag dollar sign geek. Good. <laughs> well, that's good because, you know, you're in it together. Right. Um, so, okay, cool. I'll keep going. So what do you want to do next? You want to do that? You want me to talk about the property report or? Uh, I would I would uh, yeah. suggest that what we're doing here, what we've just completed, is going to influence the budget. Yes. And what we're going to be looking at is that I hope that we also are thinking big and, and boldly enough, whether it's coming out of ad hoc or whether it's coming out of enrollment or these wonderful school audits that have been going on, I would hope that property is also going to impact this budget in some way, shape, or form. So if you want to just share the list with us, just to start a very brief dialogue about what the list of properties are. Is this from Mr. Hoyne? Yeah, this is from the Legal Counsel Office, um, and he's sharing with you the description of the property, the address, the square footage, um, the building value, the content, value and I, I'm believing he's building this off of the insurance um, hmm. reports so um, other than that oh, whether it's occupied or not you know they have they still have that rule that if you, if you, there's a building that's not there's a property the district public district owns that more than 50% of the time is not being used for instruction and needs to be on the, for two years, it needs to be put on the market and offered to community schools first. I know there was some language, there was some lobbying that to change that. I don't know that it ever did. Maybe we can ask Dan what, to update us. What but. I would like to do is, is break uh, the order a little bit and say just I'd like to make an assignment. I think I, we've mentioned it to general counsel, uh, uh, an assignment to review the current uh, state school board and legislative uh, uh, rules and regulations about that issue of sale and occupancy and use yeah. because what we heard in Columbus was a very brief presentation that sounded like some things along the line of property owning and uh, uh, disposition uh, and usage had changed that could be to our benefit. Um, and so I would just like to make that, if that's okay with the rest of the committee, I'd like general counsel to I'll look that up if, if possible and see if there has been change because that inhibits all that we can do uh, by the, the uh, previous standards. I mean, we've got property we probably would like to sell. 
but may not be able to, or we've got property we could, as the superintendent presented to the ad hoc committee, there might be properties where we can merge schools or change the purpose of a particular facility or what have you. We just wanted to get this introduced this month so that whomever is on finance in the coming months, I hope we stay somewhat stable, but that this can also influence, because there's monies to be saved and efficiencies to be gleaned from a review of our property capacity, as well as perhaps revenue to be gained. So, Mr. Craig. I was going to say, can we also just, for our purposes of clarifying, next time we talk about all this, is just clarifying what is considered occupied for educational instruction versus what is considered just occupied? Because I do think, you know, we probably do have some facilities that we are using for other purposes that, to Board Member Bolton's point, whether or not it's going to be something we keep as a storage space or warehouse space, is that the best use of that space? Is that the best value for what we want to do? Or are there other things we can do with some of that space? Or, and then if it is something that's being used for storage or whatever, and we decide to get rid of it, does it fall within the same rules with regards to buildings that have to be, as other buildings would be? That makes sense to you, Mr. Morosky. And I actually think, and this may be the place to ask the question, just for a historical content or context, the, our Iowa Street property, I think at some point there was some conversation or discussion about that. And I do think that we need to have some more conversation about Jacobs in terms of the property there as well, because we know that there is, we just need to have a discussion about it for a lot of different reasons. So I don't know if this is the time to do that, or just if it's something that maybe me and the chair can talk about when we meet or whatever is best. We can, I think it would be good. And we try, we've been trying to put like topics for next month on at the end of a meeting today, just makes sense. I think we should have property be a major part of our effort next month, whomever is on the committee. And I would, I would add that Jacobs and Iowa, and gosh, what's the name of this, the little, the school that's so close to Walnut. Reverend Mingo is there now with his folks. My understanding from the, you know, which one it is. Yeah, there's recreation dollars or excuse me, property behind it. And the city is somewhat interested in, and it's possible that the, so I would definitely let's add, let's say, let's call it properties of interest. And I would, I would say that Jacobs would be definitely one. I think you're right. And definitely Iowa. Well, and our property in, in North Fairmount too. And our, yes. Yeah, yeah, Heinhold property. And Heinhold's on Westwood Northern Boulevard. Yeah, it's a vacant big lot. I mean, if we were ever to do something about Iowa, Heinhold might. Oh, that's the one that's just a lot. Yeah. Okay. So let's just, let's say properties of, properties of interest or whatever. And let's add those three or so. So Jacobs. Jacobs, Iowa, Heinhold, and whatever is, what's that school? We no longer own it. That's why it might not be on this list. It's called Hoffman Playground. Hoffman. Yeah. It's Hoffman School. Oh, the old Hoffman building. Old Hoffman School. Because we looked at that very seriously as a place to put one, maybe a seventh grade level from Walnut for classroom space. It almost looks like Walnut and it's within walking distance, but more particularly the city and there are other developers that are interested because I think Mr. Reverend Bingo, it might be. There's a, there's a, there's a school in there though right now. Yeah. Sometimes there's some. What academy? Is that a charter school? Yeah. Yeah. It's been, it's been off and on used from different charter schools over the years. It's one of the ones we had to let go. But I do think this gets to a little bit of the point of the audit or the, the ad hoc committee as well as the fact that 
we have some properties and we have some buildings currently where we are not kind of living through those numbers of what the building was designed for. And so we have other spaces where we have no buildings. And the reality is that we can't address those people in there. We have no buildings past a certain grade level. If we don't. give you a high level again this isn't broken down like salaries benefits purchase services that is something to do but just wanted to give you this high level review all right um the next page is going to be just the budget for 23. um and again just <laughs> comparing the two um what? i think what jen what was the was the potential expansion related to um, additional students being, being serviced. 
Um, when the when you say additional students, you're not talking about the growth of seats. Are you talking about expansion of different kinds of students being served? And what I mean, was the growth about? More enrolled preschoolers. Okay, more enrolled preschoolers, right? Not changing the categories of who would be serving. Who we would be serving. Can you define the uh, Going to a lower age group. Oh, no. Or going no. to a higher income that would be subsidized. This is the current budget, so there's no change. There, there's nothing that's changed in terms of age or. Uh, okay. Because do we yet have an agreement? We don't. So, what's the status of the agreement if it were to change or not change? Or, I mean, because the previous other. Expired, we extended it, and then I'm not sure what the status is right now. Oh, my God. So, <clears throat> The, the mics are dead. I'm using the uh, backup microphone. Okay, so just uh, in, in my check-in with um, our general counsel on Tuesday, uh, we had some conversation about it. So there is additional work that's being done on the the, the um, on, on in the preschool promise um, area. Um, we pushed a little less leading up to the levy. Right. And so now it's we're, we're beginning to go through that process. So by next month, we should be able to. Okay. Good. Good. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Now again, uh, I'm sure it's been mentioned uh, throughout the, the, the district of uh, the need that we have, unless I've missed it while I was ill. The need, unfortunately, to make a new um, appointment, PPS appointment, to preschool on this board. Mm -hmm. To the death of um, mm -hmm. Dr. Owens, oh, Dr. Owens okay. and we will need to be doing that. And he <coughs> served as the chair. I don't think that we have to push on that someone would have to be the chair, although we've been very proud that, yes, uh, Representative has been chair. Again, after uh, Reverend Graham, uh, Father Graham, that uh, the only person citywide that had almost the same stature yeah. uh, was Dr. Owens. So um, maybe you'll come back and represent us. Uh, not really. Okay, so uh, Superintendent, if you can kind of look into that appointment, I will. That would be great. Any, um, uh, keep, keep going on early childhood. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, you're good. Um, so if we go to like page three, um, this has FY22 students. Um, <clears throat> so normally the number of students that you see in the monthlies relate just to the preschool expansion. So that's what the top category is. Um, so there were like, this was as of November of 2021, there were 853 students, 797 were considered full day, and 56 were considered half day. What I did here is I do get reports from them monthly that identify the number of students in each of the other funding categories. Oh, okay. And so these are the, this includes the data that's presented for that. So instead of, we also usually show the total number of students to 1,877. So you can see that additional 1,000 students where their funding uh, comes from. If this 1,870 says that are just CPS kids, not CPS and CPS. Okay, so exclude CPP kids. And I did have another, but I don't think it made it into the um, the pot because I did get uh, from Hector at CPP. So this was at September 22. They had a total of 545 students. And what they consider full-time versus half-time, they were saying half-time would be enrolled to attend between three and a half hours up to six and a half. Um, for CPS, in talking to Vera, um, we look at are they enrolled five days or not. That's an important distinction oh. on our side. And on their side, it's not necessarily the number of days, but the number of hours per day. But again, so they were showing a much less half time, like 23 students uh, versus 522 full time. 
So if you take that, just to get a grand total, that we have CPS 1,800, and they have an additional 500 that they're servicing. So almost. Current year. So then current year, for us, we're going from 1,877 to 2,035 for all the CPS and home students. Um, and actually that number I used for CPP was 545. The year before was almost, was 618, was actually a little bit high. So pre-COVID, our preschool expansion student, CPS's preschool expansion students were around 650, 680 preschool. We're up to 980. So preschool has bounced back from COVID. Um, not um, uh, a CPS preschool. Close, close, yes. close. May not be perfectly close. And she's um, planning to expand more seats. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. And, and there'll be some cyclical, as you know, like one year's award may be higher than the other. So some of those things go into right. There's definitely growth in the number of student service. So, I think, you know, I actually appreciate this information being able to see the comparables as well of, of where their funding sources are. Because I also think there is a question of where students, which students are, are we seeing a growth in? Right? Because there's some areas where, for instance, you know, I can see from year, last year to this year, students who fell underneath the special education category increased, whereas some other groups decreased. And I think it's helpful for us to know as well, because if we're getting students where we're Bigger required more resources, or uh, we're going to need more in order to do the program. That's helpful to know. Well, that was a big battle early on with the yeah. Society Fiscal Promise team um, that they wanted us to fund the expansion of um, special services staff, special education services staff. My point was, well, we wouldn't be growing and identifying those preschoolers had we not been expanding preschool. So the expansion budget should be paid for that. So we added a new diagnostic team and um, more itinerant teachers to go out and serve the newly added preschoolers in CPP and in CPS buildings as well. So um, that's grown a little bit at a time, but um, so they they provided that. But holistically, I don't think that we've ever publicly presented. We're spending thirty-two million dollars on preschool. From all sources, seven different sources of funding, and I, we always in public talk about the fifteen million dollar general fund set aside out of that levy, and we we spend less than half of that. CPP spends the the majority of that, and we're we're dipping into that unspent cash from prior years. But thirty two million dollars is a lot of money, and so I for think that number of students for preschool. Yes, preschool classes are limited to a smaller size than we a kindergarten class would. And they require um, a paraprofessional and a nap aide in the classroom with them. So there's three adults in the classroom. Well, I do think for the last maybe six or seven months or more, or maybe even the last budget, we've been telling people that this preschool budget is expanding more than we can tolerate. And we've already we had to eat into the reserve. And so we're not going to be able to maintain this kind of growth. We've also challenged CPP that this is supposed to be last dollar in. Correct. And I haven't seen other dollars that they have contributed. That's correct. And that has to change. That was part of our um, section of the master agreement um, yes. revision. And then, you know, quite frankly, um, the entire state should fund, help fund. There was always rumors that they were good, that um, DeWine yeah. was going to help fund preschool. Right. Uh -huh. That was his first election. Nice rumor. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, this is actually a budget <coughs> challenge. Yes. This, is, this trend cannot continue. Right. Even though academically, it's better preparing our children for well, kindergarten. Well, it would be nice to see if that's true. Right. 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 Okay. Because why wouldn't, uh, sorry, why, okay. why, why wouldn't, we have, at least before pre-COVID, did we see the results that we claimed? Besides the socialization and the need for the children to be here and the elimination of deserts, did it impact 
achievement in a way, in an ongoing way, and if it didn't, then why not, or whatever. But this, we can't afford to keep doing this, because now other general fund dollars are subsidizing CPP. It's basically happening, because we're devoting so much more money to preschool. Well, and then we it it. drive us back to the public for more money. Yes, and yeah. you know what? Uh, maybe this board is interested in it, but it's been a pretty good principle for the last, what, decade? That we are not yeah. We're not doing that. I do think one of the struggles, is, is, in addition to the budget aspect of it, though, is the public image as to whether or not we're getting successful results for these kids who are coming through. Well, man, I know some programs might be better than others within uh, Within a different, you know, outside of outside of CP, outside of CBS, the other uh, agencies and organizations may have some benefits and some don't. And how do we measure that aspect of it as well? Because I do think at the end of the day, our services that we offer to CBS is what we technically are kind of what we control and held accountable. But that's not how the public views all of preschool promise. Right. They don't view it as just the agencies that we can dictate who works there and doesn't. And so, well, and the uh, intrinsic, inherent issues of early childhood education, the infrastructure, the discrimination against employees, uh, that it being uh, female centered, where people are being underpaid to begin with, and to continue, it's this is we have been there's been an attempt to fix that structure and i haven't seen the rest of the community charge in to help that i mean that's why there's been such a burden on the workforce council and such a burden on, on the pd piece again we can't continue to do that even at the state level oh. high school regular high school teachers consider part of the surge retirement plan and not the surge Certificated retirement. And one of the things that we are most proud of, besides being one of the great big districts in the state that had, you know, introduced not only preschool but introduced, you know, kindergarten, day long, whatever, and paid for it out of the general fund and mm -hmm. what have you, we have always, not always, but from for I don't know how many uh, dozens of years, our preschool teachers are considered full teachers. Right. And we're proud of that. And and then we get. People get mad at us because we're uh, treating properly so our preschool teachers that way, and then have said, "Well, yeah, but we can't pay in this subsistence economy of preschool and early ed the same that you pay." That's right, you can't. I mean, this is just a very difficult thing, and now we've—I think we've hit the wall. One, one other question I think would be helpful for us in seeing these numbers as they, as they continue to grow in the future years is also if there are areas like this, again, I'm looking at the numbers now, like special education is one where we don't have full time, potential people who are full time, the majority of them are packed right? The, the students, at least uh, by our numbers, of where they're funding sources are coming. I think it'd be also helpful to know those types of, those types of things as we think of strategies. As to where are students getting, you know, if we have half day in areas where they have more challenges, or do we have areas where they're full day? Because uh, in that same way, again, think about what can we do and what can't we do, and what gives a benefit. We know that some of these things are benefiting social socialization in that aspect of it, but also, if we have a student for half day. Does that half day provide them enough of a benefit that they're then better prepared for kindergarten? And so forth. Yeah. And I think that's something. Again, I don't know how that's we measure point. that or how we think about that, but I think that aspect of it, and maybe something we say, look, those are just students that we know are high need, and we got to care for them. And we make that a value statement, but recognizing if we do that, then that means something else we can't do. That's right. It's a choice. It's a right. I will say too, from when we have our our. Thank goodness we have a new congressman, uh, Mr. Lansman, who yes. I can remember sitting at Central Parkway Kirsch's uh, <laughs> years ago when he was pushing the preschool promise. And indeed, we were using the Denver model. 
one of the most important things is that, as he was trying to get CPS to, to be in favor of this, uh, one of the most important things how it adapted was if the other preschool, the private preschool entities and providers actually worked within the Denver curriculum, it had an impact. If you don't do that, it's not going to have an impact. So you might be okay with colors and socialization and thank God the children in safe places, but it's not impacting our efforts because uh, that was the number one thing about Denver. They said no, you don't have to have a you have to have that interfacing with the curriculum of the major. I think we are. If nobody has any other questions about preschool, if nobody has any other suggestions about what should be on that property piece, or uh, we know, if you guys could word what the agenda would look like, not just the stuff that you need to have to do regularly, which is kind of suspended today, but when coming back, the next steps, contracts, how if you can tell um, Ms. Davis how that should be. Do you want us to do that verbally or just send her an email? Or send her an email, that'd be okay. great. But uh, just so we know we're doing that, yeah. we know we're doing property. Anything else? Yes, and just to the property, we are, to the property, we also want to add um, the consideration for what does it mean to be occupied for a question versus not. Yes. To this, to this actual um, to the so, yeah, and yeah, that to that yes, and if we can find out what the new regulations are about this position of property, uh, I, uh, that would that would be good. Uh, and uh, yeah. general counsel's review of the new policies. Or yes. Laws or laws, <laughs> whatever it is, and and that would that would be great. The traditional financial reports will be submitted to you. Right? Yes, um, that would be and then one in January. As long as we get to keep having our friends. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then in January we'll return to the normal prison. That would be great. The the other the other thing I would add is I, I as I already told this treasurer, I remain interested and I told everybody about the crossing guard piece. I would like to reabsorb those. And what that would mean for the employees, and also I continue to be very interested in the internal um, bus fleet, be it van, be it whatever. Yeah. So some aspect of transportation. Yes. So a question on the crossing guards, just because I've, I've, in in my thirty years of experience, I've never worked in a district that paid for their own crossing guards. Uh, we always work the city. Oh, so yeah. at one point, did we pay for the crossing guards? Were they our employees? We paid for the. I, I mean, I know we paid for them. I'm sorry. Oh, Were they our employees? I don't know if I can recall. Over. Okay. I know, like, historically, I know there have been a lot of services that have been part of things that the city provided that over time, for their budget purposes, they made decisions. <clears throat> and for our need purposes, we've had to pick up the slack. They used to pay for the city nurses too. Yeah, they yeah. did. And then, and then Bobby Stern died. And so when Bobby Stern wasn't there, they tried uh, to cut up the SROs out too. Yeah, they did. <laughs> Can I ask too that since the member Craig has mentioned this, I would like to see on some of these contracts, mm -hmm. uh, contract outing, whatever. Uh, where's the city? Uh, I mean, you know, we contact our crossing guards as a vendor. I mean, and, and the nurses. Uh, and and the, the nurses, uh, the, the, the other, you know, some of the health. Uh, the city is somewhere here, and in my understanding, we've had somebody at city, somebody here in the board, has something that we're all going to relate with one another more between the. Uh, was it the recreation center, uh, Mr. Prosky, or? Well, that was that was an audit of like what our it's in line with this actually yeah. the partnership. Like what exactly you know reinvigorating him between the rec centers and ID. 
we know we get along well, we do good together. But again, like everything else we talked about today, it's kind of piece by piece. Um, so, and quite frankly, there are some areas, I think cans, I think that's what I'm saying about first, um, where you can almost have like a campus idea, I think, with PRC and the and school. And, but anyway, that's. I think as we look at property, and this is a someone that's no longer on city council, uh, couldn't tell. There was a long discussion about the fact that we look at where our schools are, see what else is around our schools, whether it's Pleasant Hill, there's a library, there's uh, recreation fields, or the rec centers. Mm -hmm. to, to begin to expand for the vision of the community that our schools are on our own campuses, but there are these wider campuses, Aiken, Rec Center, Town Hall, uh, yeah, uh, the woods themselves. So we don't have to do that next time we do property, but that is something that I think the community would embrace of greater cooperation, greater uh, police protection. I think that would be good to add into what ad hoc is doing with regard to okay. the thing is that there are things like wise libraries, yeah. rec centers that are in some of those areas that make, make some of those spaces more easily able to have the students there, whereas others may have. I think you make the joke about like there's some parts of our city where you would think that there should be a school building or something that there is like nothing. And for whatever and reason, there, once was. there is nothing, and there's not much we can do on that end, but there may be other. Been to feature partners, not vendors. <laughs> <laughs> building, building neighborhoods. Okay, cool. Anything else to add to? You're going to send the email to Ms. Davis. Mm -hmm. We are good. Good year. Good year. Good year. I, I would hope that uh, people that are on finance will be able to pay off. Good. I'm yeah, sure it's the worst thing to write and say. <laughs> <laughs> you get a letter today. <laughs> I gotta rethink that. It's black and white. So yes, thank you all for wonderful work here, and I feel like we're moving. We um, uh, action team, man. Yep. Action team. No more same old, same old. Go for it. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Oh, Everybody, I love you. Oh, happy year. That's your record. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are, cool. we, are we adjourned? Oh, yeah, you have to say uh, that. Word. I don't know. Are we done? We said good luck to everybody. <laughs> Just <say> the word. <laughs> <laughs> good luck, people. Nobody joined us today. They never come to this one. Five. Five. Joined us today, but nobody wanted to speak. Yeah. Told me. I was told. I promise. Who watched? Can you give us names? Dad. Sure. <laughs> Sally Grimes. Oh well. Uh, Johnson. <laughs> Ed Puff. Who was the first? Who was the first? Not Sally. Uh, just Johnson. Just Johnson. There could be a few of those. Um, Ed Puff. Uh, Lauren Roberts. Still our wonderful oh, auditor. And Isaac Turn. We still recording? Yeah. Oh, we are. Because yeah. mm -hmm. we haven't said the magic <laughs> We are a jerk. <laughs>